If you've been around here over the last few weeks, Brother Moore's been gone a couple of times, and so we did a couple of things a little bit differently on a few Friday nights. We had a table sitting up here, and we had a couple of guests come in, and we talked a little bit about the family. How many of you saw some of that or heard something about that? Yeah, a lot of you were our church family, and you knew that. And we talked a little bit about the family, and we talked a little bit about our home lives and things like that. And uh, then I spoke on a Sunday, um, I guess last week or two weeks ago or something like that. Some, some are shaking, some are, yeah, whatever. Um, and I just kind of felt like maybe I was supposed to put some of those things together so, uh, for tonight. So I got a title for you. It's Homes of Honor. Homes of Honor. And, um, you know, I was thinking about this the other day, Keith and I were talking to somebody. I don't know who we were talking to. And we were talking about somebody had sent something to us and, and something came up about it. And this person had, had basically, I guess, blackmailed, was trying to blackmail me. And um, she said, um, if you don't help me with my divorce and tell them this basically a lie... Um, then I'm going to tell all the stuff I know about you and Brother Keith's marriage. And I said, um, I said, I see. I said, well, I guess you can go ahead and tell it since I basically already told it from the pulpit. <laughs> I said, now, would you like a tape to remind you of what exactly it was? <laughs> and the blackmail was kind of gone then. You know, so if you don't already know it, there's a lot of people we assume, Keith and I have, have said this a lot, we assume a lot of people know a lot of things because we've been doing this for so long. But you know, a lot of people don't know a lot of that stuff and they weren't in earlier meetings and they weren't in some of the things that we've talked about. But some of the reasons that this is so passionate for Keith and I, and it's so strong on our hearts about marriages and about homes and this sort of thing is because when we first got married, I tell it kind of funnily, but it wasn't very funny. Um, he came from a home where the dad was a very strict uh, head of the house, you know? Everything was his way. You know, and there was no give and take on it, okay? And I came from a home where my mom ruled everything. She had the say of everything. So when you put the dad that ruled everything together and the mom that ruled everything together, it was kind of like you tied two cats across a clothesline and put them out there and you see who came out at the end. You know, it was like, <laughs> you know, and you had to see who was going to win at the end. So you know, you have to learn. You don't know anything until you've learned it, you know? And we didn't know anything about marriage, nothing at all, you know? And so the reason that we want to teach people so much about marriage so that they don't go through all the stuff that we went through and, and the only thing, and I could tell you a lots of stuff, I could tell you from now till Jesus comes, the thing that spared us. If I, but I, if I had to say one thing, that spared Keith and I from being divorced today, that spared us from uh, having churches, having ministries, having, uh, let me do this before, and, and remind me where I was. Y'all remember where I was, okay? I want every person that is either got married or, or uh, well, basically got married or has kids or is about to get married that's in this church or the Branson Church because Keith and I came to the church to stand up. Because we had a church. Stand up. Yeah. See, and that's just here in this church and we haven't been here this long. Now, I know Branson's got a lot more people than that. Now, these people wouldn't even have families. Y'all got kids. I mean, they don't have kids. They got kids. They got kids. Um, they, people wouldn't even have kids, you know, if it wouldn't be that way. Y'all can be seated. Now, a lot of these people wouldn't have ever met if Keith and I wouldn't have had the church. Do you understand what I'm saying? It affects people's lives that you stay together and you do what you're supposed to do. 
That's right. Do you see what I'm saying? People down the road that we don't even know. Look, John, John, I wouldn't have known. Well, it'd be so sad. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Where we don't understand where what would happen. I don't. I don't know. Would she have met somebody else, and he have met somebody else? I. I don't know what would have happened. You know how everybody would have connected or what would have happened in all those situations. But the only thing that kept us together, we both know it, was we decided we want to serve God more than we want our way. Amen. That's the only thing. He'll tell you, I'll tell you, we want to serve God more than we wanted our way. That's the only thing that spared us. And he talked about it last night. That's the only thing that gets people over in the things that they want to do. So I want to talk to you tonight about some of those things. And I want to remind you of some things you probably already know. Most every person will know them. But sometimes it just helps to remind us of some things. Like let's go through the, uh, the I don't know, even know what you'd call it, the um, ranking of how things are supposed to be. So who's first? God's first. Then who would be second in the household? Now let's try that one more time. <laughs> Just about five ladies said it. Who would be second in the, in the ranking of the family? Okay, the husband would, not the kids, right? Somebody, we've got it all twisted sometimes. It's not even the wife anymore, it's the kids now. So who would be second? And, and then third, and then fourth, the children. And it does us good to remember these things because it'll keep us out of big trouble if we'll just remember those things to start with. You know, because a lot of times when we get those things out of sync, it gets our life out of sync. It gets everything in our life out of sync. And I think you'll see some of those things tonight. So what I want to do tonight is go through some ways that we honor God. And what happens is when we honor God, I remember Brother Hagin telling this story. And if you've ever heard Brother Hagin's, a lot of you have heard him, you know, a good bit. But he used to tell this all the time. He used to tell, and Keith will probably have to help me get it right, but I'll try, okay? It's like when I tell jokes, I tell the punchline, and then he goes back and tells the story. <laughs> so uh, it's always good when he's here to help me because a lot of times I have to do this by myself, so this is quite nice. Um, he would tell the story about this, this couple that came to him, and they were all upset because their teenage son had run away from home. And they were very, very upset, you know? And... He told them that they had basically run away from home. They'd run away from Ramah. They'd run away from the Word of God. They'd run away from the things of God. They'd run away from everything that they knew that they were supposed to be doing. And when they ran away from home, then their son ran away from home. Do you get the picture? And he told them, that when they would go back home and get hooked in and doing the things that they were supposed to be doing, that it wouldn't be long until their son would come back home. And he'd been gone for a while. Am I correct in, t in the way I'm telling this? And so anybody else remember that, him telling that? Um, he, then their son would come back home. I don't remember the length of time. It was, I kind of looked for the story, but I didn't find it. Um, but it wasn't long till they got hooked back in and they were doing what they were supposed to be doing. And lo and behold, guess what happened? The son came back home. And he was back in and he was doing what he was supposed to be doing. And he, would, he wasn't off course anymore. Well, they got off course and so what happened? He got off course. And I think we forget those things in our lives. I think we as Christians forget the fact that there's a messed up world out there. It's really, really messed up. And I have people, I'll pick on Dan just a minute. Dan loves me, so I'll pick on him. He, they, they all know I'm going to pick on him sometimes. Sometimes Dan can get frustrated at people because they don't move as quickly as he moves. <laughs> I love Dan because Dan moves as quick as I move. 
Very few people move as quickly as I move, but they, Dad does, and he moves as quickly as I move. But when people don't move as quickly as he moves, he can get frustrated at them because they don't do as much as he does in the time frame he can do it in. And, and so I'm all the time telling him, you can't get frustrated, you have to train them. You can't get frustrated, you have to train them. And so we'll get new people and I'll say, you have to train them. Well, you know, there's a whole world out there that there's no need in us getting frustrated at. There's no need in us getting frustrated at the people out there in the world. We have to train them in how they're supposed to live. And if they don't see anybody living right, there ain't nobody training them. There's nobody training them on how to live. There is no one that they can follow. If I'm telling an employee, train them on how to do this, they're going to follow you around and see what you're doing and learn how to do this. But they're laying around or they're doing things that they shouldn't be doing. They're sitting there talking on their cell phone or they're going to lunch or they're going to the quick trip or whatever the store is to get the a soda and they're never working. What are they going to learn to do? Nothing. They're going to learn to go to the store and get a soda and take off and, and sit around and talk on their cell phone. They're not going to learn to do anything. Well, it's the same way with us as Christians. So Isaiah 62, don't turn there because we're not going to turn to just everything that I've got here. I'm going to quote you a few things and I think you'll remember most of it. Isaiah 62 talks about us. And it talks about that we're the righteousness of the Lord and, and we're His brightness and we're going to be uh, the crown of His glory and, and we're his, going to be His royal diadem the hand of the, at the hand of the Lord. But then it goes on in verse 10. You can put up verse 10, 62.10. It says, Go through the gates, go through the gates and prepare the way of the people. Cast up, cast up the highway, gather out stones. Now read that last part with me. Lift up a standard for the people. He's talking about us before that, that we're His and we're his glory of his hand, and we're his royal diadem. But we're supposed to go forth, and we are supposed to lift up a standard for the people. We are the standard that others are looking at. We are the picture of what the world is looking at. And what happens is this world is messing up. Are you seeing it? Guys are in love with guys. Girls are in love with girls. Kids are going to school and the teachers are saying, it's okay for you to do that. You're just confused. No, you're not confused. You just know who you are. Yes. There, it's, the, it's everybody else that's confused. Who is their standard? Why are they getting that way? Why is the world getting confused saying when you see something, the guy is an idiot or all the crazy, the woman is beaten down? Why is all that going on? Because they have no true examples of it. They have no strong husband leading. And they have no wife secure in her place. That's not afraid to do what God's told them to do. They don't have that. We are supposed to be that. Every place that we go. We're supposed to be that person that when they see us, 
they see that standard. So I want to start out tonight, and I want to start with, I'm not going to start with God, because he's pretty good with his part. We may come back to him, though. So we're going to start with the man, because he's the first one on the list, right? And let's just read this. Before we do, let me, let me kind of go by my notes here. Keith said something the other night, and it reminded me of something, and it'll help us. He said, Adam and Eve were hanging out by the tree. Right? Y'all remember that last night? It reminded me of something. When we lived by the river, and I was responsible to set out, you've never done this, I'm sure, a tree branch with a line on it and catch catfish for our supper every night because we were so broke. Then I'd clean them and cook them. That was our dinner. But if it rained, and I had to go out there on that steep bank and get those lines, does anybody know what was going to happen? I'm going in the water for a swim. Because I was too close to the edge of that slippery bank I'm going in. And the Lord told me when he said that, that's where most Christians are. That's why so many marriages and so many homes are failing is because they're staying too close to that edge of that slippery bank. He said, if you'd have put you some poles way back further to where you didn't have to get so close to that edge, you wouldn't have slipped in that water so many times. Well, it's the same thing with Christians. If we wouldn't get so close to that edge, trying to see what's over on the other side, we wouldn't be falling in with the world and doing all the things. Evil communications corrupt our good manners. It's not like we don't know what we're supposed to do to hold up our standard. It's just, it's so tempting to get over there so we can see what's going on over there. But maybe some of this stuff will remind us of some things. The first thing is we want to, men, honor God's standard. Look at Colossians 3, verse 16, King James. It says, you all know this, but we're going to read it anyway. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts. Now the next verse, whatever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the Father, to, the, to God and the Father by Him. Now, if we just remembered that one sentence right there every day of our lives, we'd keep ourselves out of so much trouble. We wouldn't lose our cool. We wouldn't do anything we weren't supposed to do. If, if we did everything we did, word and deed, in the name of the Lord. We'd stay out of trouble a lot. But let's go on and you'll see what I'm talking about. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as is fit in the Lord. It didn't say, wives, think about it. And it didn't say, husbands, make your wives. It says it's a choice that a wife, you choose to submit yourself to your husband. And it didn't say for a husband to make his wife do this. Now, recently, there's been a lot of things that, that have come across our paths as pastors and things 
that we've noticed about some things. And I, I can stand here all night long and tell you that a wife is supposed to submit. I can pound it in your head, but that's a choice you have to make. But I will tell you this, the less you do it, the less honor you're going to have. And that's a bold statement. But the less you do it, the less honor you're going to have. The more you submit, the more honor you will have. Why is that? Because God said do it. It's just that simple. And whatever He says do, when we do it, we honor Him. And He's going to honor us. But this next part that I'm talking about is as is fit in the Lord. I was thinking about something as I was doing this just earlier this evening, and I was thinking about Abraham and Sarah. And I started laughing out loud because I thought about if Abraham and Sarah would do like some of the people we have to counsel sometimes, it would be just hilarious. Because if Abraham would have ridden Sarah the way that some of the men that we've had to deal with lately, I don't know what would have happened. But it's apparent that the husband was not telling the wife everything to do from what shirt to wear to what pair of shoes to wear to what kind of makeup to wear to what color he wanted her hair to. Because he told her to do what she wanted to with, with Hagar. And she told him to go sleep with Hagar. Do you understand what I'm saying? There's a lot of confusion about this stuff. The Lord is not telling... Let's see how I can put this. Wait till we get to the next part. Let's read the next one. It comes out better. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. What does that mean? Can you always be mad about something? Can you always be looking for something that they're not doing right? If you're always looking for something, you're always going to find something. It said for a husband to love his wife. It didn't say for the husband to look for something to pick on his wife about all the time. If you want to find something that she's doing wrong, I can guarantee you, you will find it. Because there's not a woman in this place that doesn't have a fault. Or a two or three or five or ten or twenty-five or fifty-two. But just flip the mirror around. You can't be looking for faults in your spouse and being bitter because it's taken them 40 years to fix it because she could probably name the very same amount of things about you that she thinks you need to fix. That's not our job as spouses to constantly be judging what the other one needs to fix or the other one needs to do. That's right. it's, not, it's not what we're called to do. And the worst thing that a husband can do, one of the worst things, I'm so thankful I have a godly man of God. I mean, I thank God for it every single day because he never, he would never, has never, I don't ever remember him doing anything like this. He would never say to me, Phil, God said, if God didn't say. But we have heard it over and over and over again. God said, you need to do this. And basically telling their spouses 
that they need to do stuff and that they've heard from God about what they need to do or what they need to wear or where they need to be or where they need to go or, or that they shouldn't do this when it's really just their likes and dislikes. I would never be able to follow Keith everywhere and do everything that we do if it was just his opinion about what he liked and what he didn't like. But he doesn't do that. It's not like that. It's not his opinion. It's not his likes and dislikes. We don't go by his likes. He don't do what he likes and he dislikes. And no marriage and family should be based on your likes and dislikes. It shouldn't just be about that. If you're going to be the head of a household, you're supposed to love your family and give yourself for them. Now, I know the guys are not really caring for this, but I told you this was the guy's part. Okay? It's, it's very important that we see this because we've been dealing with it more and more, and guys are kindly it, getting a bad rap right now in the world. Am I right? So the world needs to see how true men of God can actually love a woman. How they cannot be afraid to show affection and actually love a woman and it's not going to mar their character to show that they actually love somebody. And that they're not a wimp because they actually love somebody and that they're faithful to them. And that when another woman comes by, that they don't want their woman to dress like, that their eyes are going. But they get mad at their wife if they dress that way. Why do you think there's such a strong thing about that Maybe Two movement right now? It's because... Guys, have, they've lost respect. We don't want that. We are the standard, guys. Yes. You are the standard. Yes. You are bigger than this. You're stronger than this. You're smarter than this. You're wiser than this. Yes. You're greater than this. You're gooder than this, as Dave says. Because you have the greater one living inside of you. We have to hold a standard for every man in the whole wide world to see. That it wouldn't matter if a woman walked in front of you, I don't know how to say it any other way, but T naked, you just stand there and go, hmm. <laughs> because you're the standard. That's you. That's who you are. And you don't sit there and watch things on TV with, the, with people around. And you don't do things other people do. Because you are the standard. You. The godly men. And you don't sit in some little cubicle and some little something and talk and text and do things. You're the standard. Now, I know that there's been a lot of stuff that's gone on. But it doesn't change who we're supposed to be. Yes. We can be higher than what we were. We'll come back to some of this in just a second. But children, because I come back to it down here again. So hang on. I'm not finished with you. <laughs> children. Now, we need to differentiate just a minute about children and young adults. Parents haven't understood the difference between a child and a young adult. 
When they get to be 18, 21, they're no longer children. And you should have taught them how to be led for themselves. Husbands, love your wives. Be not bitter against them. In other words, don't let the sun go down. You know, you know the verse. Children, obey your parents in all things, for it's well-pleasing to the Lord. But when a child gets to be 18, I'll say 21, so no parents get upset with me. Again, we've dealt with it. We've had kids come to us that they're 21 years old. They've been dating this guy and going with this guy for a, a while. And they go to their parents and they're good kids. We've been around them for a long time. They're good kids. And the parents say, no, we don't think y'all should get married. No, 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 no. They're both love God. They're both of the same spirituality. They're both doing really good. And, and the parents are just downers on it. I mean, just, they, they couldn't be happy for them no matter what they did. It's sad because the parents are making their kids run away from them. They can't be happy for them. It's not how you want to be as parents. You want to love your children and trust that they can be led too. Because you raised them to learn how to be led, right? So at some point, we have to trust them to be led. Then fathers, this is the next one that goes right with that. Provoke not your children to anger, lest they be what? Discouraged. Discouraged. Then the next one is servants. Obey in all things your masters. Um, according to the flesh, with eye services, men pleasers, uh, not in singleness of heart, but in singleness of heart and fearing, and whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Now, I put this down, um, I think it was in the Youngs. Put the Youngs up there. Uh, verse 18. See how it did that for just a minute? It said the wives with an exclamation point. Now put verse 19. The husbands. Then the next one. The children. Then the next one. The fathers. Then the next one. The servants. It's talking to that person. It's not talking to the other one. Do you understand that? And the other thing is... Um, Husbands, it didn't say that your wife was your servant. It's got a whole category for that. <laughs> Maybe you should believe God for some extra money and get you a servant. <laughs> But it didn't say your wife was your servant. Let's go back over those again. Number 18, the wives be subject to your own husbands as is fit in the Lord. Now, that's, uh, let's go back to that in just a minute, what I was talking about. When I get something from the Lord, I don't just go and demand to Keith, we're going to do this. I normally just pray about it, and normally he gets it, or he's already got it, and he'll bring it up to me. And then we're just in agreement. But now there is sometimes. <laughs> Especially when I first started working for him. that I thought I knew how to do business stuff and he didn't have a clue. Because I, with a big I, hadn't been doing that for a very long time. And he had never done it. So what did he know about it? And there was those cats again. I thought we had gotten past it. 
till. I mean, I was in business. I was making a thousand dollars a day. I knew more than him. You don't understand. I knew more than him about business stuff. But that's not what that said. When it came to the ministry stuff, it became time. It didn't matter how much I knew. It came time for me to do what he said do. Because he is not only the head of the house, he's the head of the ministry. Five people agree with me. We got to start. We got to start. We got to start. Doesn't matter how much you know. Doesn't matter how well you know how to do something. It matters who the head is. Can you tell I've moved on to the woman part? But let me back up for just one second to do, tell you something that the Lord reminded me. Talking about your children and the dads. We are to honor the Lord in everything we do. Honor is not something that you play with. You remember I told you the story about Brother Hagin at the beginning. We can pretend that our kids will do what we say and not what they see. It ain't never going to happen. They're going to do what you do. They're going to do it today and they're going to do it tomorrow and they're going to do it the next day. And if they see you call your boss when you're not sick and say, not feeling good today or whatever the case might be and tell a little white lie that you can't come in today or tell your wife a little white lie where you were or tell him, don't tell mommy that we did this. Then you get a note from their school teacher and they say they lied to me or they lied to you and tell you where they were when they're 16. You have absolutely no right to get upset with them. You taught them. You trained them in the way they should go with your actions. Are you honoring the Lord in it? Are you honoring the Lord when you called somebody and lied to them? Or when you said on the phone, tell them I'm not here. Tell them we can't do it because we have this. Tell them we don't have the money. Anything that is a lie then your child lies to you. You have absolutely no right to get upset with them because you as a parent train them. You can't get upset with your child for something that you train them to do. That's not fair. You go in a store, mother or father, you go ballistic, You change a tag. You do something cheating. Your taxes. You do something that's dishonest. You take something you shouldn't take. You tell somebody you don't owe them something or you try to, lack of a better word, hoodwink somebody out of something that you really do owe them and you know you owe them but you tell fibs about it. 
and you cheat them out of it, and your child cheats on a test, you have no, no, no grounds to get upset with them. You train them as a parent. There's absolutely no honor in that. We are the what? We are the standard. And the reason that our kids, the reason that our church members, the reason that our families are getting off track is because they're following us. They're following us when we go in that store and we chew out that person because they char overcharged us $5 on something. Or when we chew out that waitress because they didn't get our order right in front of our kids or in front of somebody else. We are the standard. We are basically the honor bearers. We are the ones that carry His glory here on the earth. When you walk into a place, you should think, I represent God. I represent God. And you should walk in just like that. I represent God. I represent God. I represent God. And you shouldn't be ashamed of it. Amen. But you are. We are the standard. And instead of us being the standard, we've gone into theaters and watched things that we have to hide almost when we go out. Because we don't want nobody to know it was us. Or we watch it on our TVs. Anything you wouldn't want your eight-year-old to watch with you in the living room or your seven-year-old to watch with you in the living room, you shouldn't be watching. Because you're training them. You're training them to be sneaky. You're training them to do things behind people's backs. See, people don't like it. But it's true. Kids can sense if they are of any age at all. They have the Holy Spirit inside of them. And they know right from wrong. And they know good from bad. And if we're hiding things that we know that we're doing wrong, there's a spirit of that in our homes. Yes. And your kids can feel that. Yes. If you're staying up half the night looking at porn, we've seen it. We've seen it. Parents think that they're being so, so cautious to hide things from their kids. Their kids don't know what they're doing. The next thing we know, we're having to go to school and talk to the teachers because the kids are there looking up somebody's dress. Or trying to feel up somebody in the sixth grade. They're calling us as the pastors. But why is that happening? Coincidence? I think not. I think not. They're following their standard. But then when they get home, they get in trouble. They shouldn't get in trouble. Because they're just doing what they've been trained to do. Let's go on. All right. 
Proverbs 15, 33. See how quiet it is? Maybe I should change topics. Maybe we should talk on the dance of the Lord. No, we won't. Proverbs 15, 33. NIV. The fear of the Lord teaches man wisdom. Read that next part with me. And humility comes before honor. So if there's been things, guys, that's been going on in your family, your spouse, your kids, and you know they know. You know they know. The best thing that you can do as a dad of a household it's not easy, never easy, humility never is, is to go sit down in front of your spouse, your kids, every one of them and say, I messed up. I messed up. I shouldn't have been doing that. I shouldn't have lied to my boss. I shouldn't have done that in that store. I shouldn't have cheated on that. I shouldn't have looked at that. We shouldn't have watched that. Wait, just recently, I was counseling with some people. I kid you not. There was like a 12-year-old and a 14-year-old and a 16-year-old or something like that. I forget their ages, but it was around in those ages. And I was counseling them with them, and I'm talking to them. And I said, so what were you doing again? We were watching this. I said, you were watching what? Now, these, are, these parents way should have known better. Both the parents. I said... I put that on my TV for about five whole seconds and I turned it off. And I'm 22. Yes. <laughs> Y'all are slow. <laughs> Whew. No wonder it's taking me so long to get this. <laughs> and I turned it off because it was too strong for my little ears. And you guys watch that? Were you by yourself? No, our parents were in the room. Guys, we are a standard. Just because the world does some things doesn't mean we are supposed to do those things. Just because the world watches naked people on TV doesn't mean we should watch naked people on TV. Just because the world smokes marijuana doesn't mean we should smoke marijuana. Just because the world, you know, we have to think about the other person. My dad was an alcoholic all my life. I don't drink. And there may be the person sitting next to you that they, you may not have a problem with a drink, but that person sitting next to you may be, have real problems with drinking. You need to think about the person sitting next to you and it should, you should care more about another person than yourself. That's, right. That's, right. That's what God's love is about. It's not about us. It's about thinking about that other person that's sitting next to you more than thinking about yourself all the time. And I'll tell you something else. The more honor you focus on and the more honor of the Lord that you put yourself into and the things of honor that you try to do for the Lord or you do do for the Lord, no trying, you do for the Lord, the more fulfilled you are. The reason people are not fulfilled is because they're too self-conscious. They're not God conscious. The more you focus on honoring the Lord and doing things His way, you'll begin to see how fulfilled you begin to get on your insides. Now, I've played a video game or two in times past, and, and I remember thinking, you know, when you've watched them and stuff, they always, you watch the preview of them or something, and the person is just going through there, and they're killing the enemy just lickety-split. Have you ever seen, anybody ever played a video game? And it's like, they just go through there, and they are just killing them, just killing them. There's just no problems with it. And you go to do it, and they kill you before you can even take a step. You know what I'm talking about? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah, people are ashamed to say. They're, they're like, <laughs> if you lie, your kids are going to know and they're going to lie to you. <laughs> anyway, I kind of relate the things of the Lord kind of this way just a little bit. I think you'll understand it. When Keith and I first started out, we 
didn't have nothing. We didn't have no money. We didn't have no cars. We didn't have no house. We didn't have no clothes. We didn't have, we had each other. Oh! <laughs> That's all we had. We didn't have nothing. And that's how it kind of starts out in these games. But as you begin to win, you win life, and you win ammo, and you win stability, and you win all these things. And so then when an enemy comes up, you're stronger, and you just whack them one time, and they're dead. <laughs> that's kind of how it is with God. Right. When you first start out to do anything for the Lord, you walk up to the devil and he goes, I know. You get hit with a cane, it knocks you down. It happened to me. Old woman, 90 years old, hit me with a cane, I was on the ground. She had a bad spirit. I don't get hit with canes anymore, I'm smarter than that. But what I'm telling you is, when you're baby and you're young in the things of the Lord, any little thing can tempt you and it can knock you down. It can throw you for a tailspin. The first little lie comes up, you lie. The first little temptation comes up to spin, you spin. The first little thing to, to lose your temper, you lose your temper. The first little thing, you just, it's just that way. And you think, I am the worst Christian in the whole wide world. And the devil convinces you of it. But you grow just a little bit. And you get a little stronger. And you grow just a little bit more. And you get a little bit stronger. And you grow just a little bit more. And you can whack that enemy with about 26 shots, you know. But then one day, the devil comes up to you and he tries to throw something at you and you go. Pfft. And he doesn't tempt you. It's like, that's not even a temptation to me anymore. And it used to be a real issue for you. Whether it's lying or stealing or porn or, or drugs or alcohol or whatever it is. And it was a real problem for you before. But you, people try to just do it on their own. But you can't do it on your own. And that's where the problem comes in. But the more you begin to do the other, it starts taking precedence over that. You, the more you start trying to honor God and think, no, I don't need to watch that. I'm going to honor God and I'm going to do this instead. Well, then it starts filling you up with that and you start overflowing with that. And this starts kind of falling by the wayside. I'm not saying it goes away right away. It's kind of like that video game. It takes just a little bit. But then you get to a point to where when the devil says, look at this, you go, are you kidding me? I wouldn't watch that. Get out of the room. We're not watching that. Let's go. And you get up and leave the movie theater. Yes. Because your spirit begins to know this is not us. This is not who we are. We are not those people. That's somebody else. We are standard holders. And we don't know who sees us. And we don't know whose life we might affect. We know who we are. Okay, so let's get to the women. We, can, we better go. Okay. I'll read you another one. It's a man's honor to avoid strife. This is Proverbs 23, 20 verse 3. It's a man's honor, honor to him to avoid strife. Whether it's with your kids or with your spouse, honor to avoid strife. And then 1 Peter 3, 7, Likewise, you husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor to the wife is the weaker vessel. All right, let's go on to um, the woman. Ephesians 5, 33, NIV. Likewise, or however, each one of you also must love his wife, as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. The Message Bible and several others says, and um, the ending of it says, and how each wife is to honor her husband. Now that's a, that's a, a gone away thing. It's like it's non-existent anymore. 
for a woman to actually honor and respect her husband. I don't care what the world says about me too. I would be willing to venture with you, and I don't want a show of hands, but there's probably not a woman in here that some man has never made a flirtatious move on. I doubt seriously that there is. But you can live with that and let it run the rest of your life if you want to. Or you can say, I'm going on with God. And forget about it. But that should not negate, change, rule, dominate, respect for man. And I think that's what this movement's trying to do. It's trying to belittle the man. And that is wrong. Because the woman is not in charge. And all the women say? Amen. A little louder? Amen. Yes. Because we're not. And if we get in charge, then it's kind of like the planets being out of sync as they roll around. Do you understand what I'm saying? If we get in charge, then it's like things get out of their, way, out of their place. We don't want things out of their place. We don't want the orbit out of whatever. I don't know anything about that stuff. Ask Keith about it. He'll tell you about it. But you know what I'm talking about. You don't want things out of the divine way that they're supposed to be because then there's chaos. And I don't know about you, but I think there's plenty of chaos in the world already. And so in order for things to go the way that they're supposed to go, we need to keep them in the order that God put them in. And if we keep them in the order that God put them in, we're all going to have victories. And you know what? I have honor beyond words. There's nobody that honors me more than Keith. He's constantly believing in me, putting me up here. You can do it. You got it. Go. You know, him and the Lord, my cheering section. <laughs> and if you don't have that, then you need to look back at have you been respecting? You reap what you sow. And, and have you been honoring? When Keith gets in this pulpit, or when he's about to get in this pulpit, my staff can tell you, anybody can tell you, I don't treat him like he's my husband. I'm not coming up here and jerking the microphone out of his hand. Let me tell it like it goes. <laughs> can y'all see me doing that? Ain't gonna happen. Ain't gonna happen. That's not the way it works. God has a plan. And if we do it the way that he intends for us to do it, and we, we honor and respect our spouses, our kids are going to see it. And all this stuff about people being confused about what they are and who they are is going to change. And the reason that people are confused about this stuff is because the mom's doing the dad's duties, the dad's doing the mom's duties, and the kids are like, I like some of that, and I like some of that, and I want to do this, and I want to do that. And they're so confused about whose role is what, and we gotta, we got to be a standard and show them whose place is what. They like the fact, the, the, the guys like the fact that mom's in charge. They want to be the one in charge, so they're confused that it's the mom that's in charge now. So I'm going to be a girl. I want to be in charge. Some people ain't smiling at me, but it's still the truth. And the Bible still says he, he made them male and female. And he made them. And write me all the letters you want. Dave has a big shredder in his office. <laughs> I ain't changing. All right. So, honor. 
Another thing it says, Proverbs eleven sixteen. It says, a gracious woman retains honor. A better way of saying that is, the NIV says it, I think. A kind-hearted woman gains respect. Kind-hearted woman gains honor. I've seen some women bless their hearts. Oh, you just want to run and hide. They're like bulls in china shops. They're going to fix it, whatever it takes. And you're going to know they were there because they're going to leave their mark. It doesn't work that way. I have won over some of the meanest, hardest, rudest, with the Lord's help, just waiting on him, just back off, wait on him. Lord, tell me when to do, tell me what to do. And then step in and say three words. I mean, some of the meanest, hardest businessmen you've ever seen. Not going in there and yelling and screaming at them like everybody else does. We don't win anybody by being mean and hard and rude. And we win by being kind-hearted yes, yes. and people seeing our kindness. And what does that do? It holds up a standard for God. It's an honor thing. God sees us as godly women. He needs some godly women. Not women that just blow off their mouths at every chance they get. Every shot that they get. Titus tells us that, Titus 2, 3, likewise, teach the older women. That's not me, by the way. <laughs> well, maybe spiritually. To be reverent in the way they live and not to be slanders or addicted to much wine, but apt to teach that, so that they can train the younger women to love their husbands and their children, to be self-controlled, to be pure, and to be busy at home, to be kind and to be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. That's what we're talking about. That we're able to honor God in everything we do. You should think about, go back to the very first part. And everything you do, am I honoring God with this? Am I representing God to my children properly? It says when we lay down, we should talk about the Lord to them. When we wake up, when we sit down, we should be representing the Lord to our children. We, we try to crack a whip and teach our children that way or, or train them or tell them what we want them to do. But we're training them in everything that we do. Exactly everything that we do. And we're training the people around us that we work with and we're training the restaurant people and we're training the male people and we're, they're seeing, you can kid yourself all you want to that people are not watching you but they are watching every move you make. And they're asking, is that what a Christian is? They're asking, is that a God I want? Now, I'm not saying that you have to be rigid and staid and you can't ever have fun. There's nobody in the whole wide world that has more fun than God. And there's nobody in the whole wide world that's going to be more fulfilled than Christians. But you have to get with God and get on his honor side and do it. I'm going to read you something here real quick. I think you'll enjoy it. Keith talked about last night about... Brother Hagen's book, Marriage, Divorce, and Remarriage. Well, I won't read you from that. I'll let him read you from that. I'm going to read you from Mom Hagen's book. The price is not greater than God's grace. How many of you have ever read that? Oh, it's an outstanding book if you have kids. Oh, it's just outstanding. I'm just going to read you a little section of it. I think, you'll, I think you'll enjoy it. If you don't, listen anyway. It says, Of course, 
Discipline plays a big part in raising children. And discipline begins at home, not in the church, not in the school. I was a disciplinarian in our house, mainly because I was with the children more than Kenneth was. As I said, my children were not perfect, but they were never hard to discipline. They were very obedient, and they never rebelled against Kenneth and I. I think one reason some children are disobedient and rebellious is they don't see the right example set in their own home. Many times, they don't see the God kind of love demonstrated by their parents. For example, if a husband and wife don't walk in love toward each other, it will be evident to their children. It'll show. A husband and wife who don't love each other are setting the wrong example for their children. If you as a parent don't show any love to your spouse, how can you expect your children to show love to others? But if a husband and wife are loving and kind to each other, then their children will grow up and they'll be loving and kind also. Whether you wanna believe it or not, your children will do what you do. They will imitate you because they see you and that's all they know. After all, who else is gonna train your children but you? You are their parents. You set the right example and walk in love towards your spouse and your children. It's so important for parents to live, in Christ, to live a Christian life before their children, especially if they're in the ministry. In the early days of our ministry, Kenneth saw ministers who didn't do that. They set the wrong example in front of their children and it hurt those children spiritually. One way a parent can set the wrong example before their children is by gossiping and being critical of others. But you should never talk badly about others, especially in front of your children. You might think your children are too young to understand what you're saying. But as they get older, they're gonna understand and they'll remember how you talked about other people. One time Ken Jr. was about 12 years old and Ken took him on the road with him to a meeting. And because he had a school holiday, they were staying in the parsonage at the church where Kenneth was ministering. And one day as they were all sitting there at the dinner table, the pastor of the church began talking badly about some of his church members and his deacons. And Kenneth said he just kept watching Ken to see how he would react. Finally, Kenneth said to the pastor, you know what, I'd just rather you'd cuss in front of my son than to criticize your church people that way in front of him. What this pastor said about his church members and deacons may have been true, but talking in the negative way about other people leaves the wrong impression on their little minds. If children hear their parents gossiping and criticizing others as they grow up, that kind of behavior is not right. It's just not. We should pray for others, not talk about them. We need others' prayers. Praying for others is part of walking in love and setting the right example. But if you don't walk in love and you're always gossiping and being critical, your children will do the same because you are their example. And I said, as parents, even ministers don't set, that don't set the right example in front of their children, if they don't show the children their God kind of love, some parents are too harsh with their children. They don't pay any attention to them at all, and they don't show the proper love or give any love to them. Now, I'm going to skip down a couple of places here and read you a couple of other little paragraphs here. Many of Ken's friends said, my dad would never let me drive a car. My dad would just scream and holler if I even ever asked him to drive a car. That's not good because it shows children that their parents don't trust them and it hurts their self-confidence. Always assure your children that they are very young, when they are very young, that they will always amount to something. Never tell them they won't amount to anything. Build their self-confidence. No matter how bad your children seem to behave, don't ever tell them they won't amount to anything. That tears down their self-confidence. You have to build confidence in children and you have to do that by training them and giving them responsibilities and by trusting them to do what you've given them to do. If you're, uh, and then it goes, she goes on to say, if you're always disgruntled and you're always gossiping and you're always disgruntled about the things of God and never happy about serving God, your children are going to pick up on this. If you don't love serving God, your children will never love serving God. It says, um, if you're always gossiping and criticizing others, or if you're griping and complaining about your husband and your children, 
and nothing ever suits you, then you're in bad spiritual shape. If that describes you, you need to turn around and go to Jesus and just let him love you back to your place in him. It's a good book, huh? My next section is about parents. Parents have an amazing role to change this world. A job to do. But the first job is being a standard. It's being an example. We as leaders have a job to do, to teach people. And then parents have a job to do, to teach and train their children. I just quoted it, but it was Deuteronomy. Teach your children, uh, Deuteronomy eleven nineteen. Teach them to your children. Talk about your ways. Uh, talk about them when you sit at home, when you go along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. You can put that down in your notes if you want it. Exodus 20 talks about Exodus twenty twelve. Honor your father and mother. Now, I'm going a different way with these things. I'm not talking about your children honoring you. I'm talking about how do you get your children to honor you? By you honoring your mother and father. If, you, if they see you dishonoring your own mother and father, then they have perfect precedence to dishonor you. It's, it's how we train them. It's not about quoting scriptures to them. It's how we train them to do things. We don't just say, the Bible says, honor your father and mother. It's the example that we set before them. We honor our father and mother. Therefore, they're going to honor their father and mother. Do you see that? It's not about just saying, the Bible says, honor your father and mother. It's about you honoring your father and mother and they will honor their father and mother. Then it says, uh, Leviticus, uh, it says, Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head and honor. Well, the NIV says, Rise in the presence of the aged or the elderly and show respect. What do you do? Who do you show respect and honor to? Who are you telling your kids they should show respect and honor to? If you want respect and honor yourself, you need to see who you are showing respect and honor to. That's right. yes. People are so big about thinking about themselves. What I want, what I need. My kids don't respect me. I, they won't listen to me. They won't do anything I'm telling them to do. They're just rebellious. Well, what are you? Who are you honoring? Who are you respecting? Who are you listening to? We fix ourselves and our children will become fixed. But you first have to go back and apologize. Hey, look, I've been setting a bad example in front of you. I've got to fix some things. And when I get these things fixed, I'm not going to be concerned about you. You're going to be okay. We've been going about this all wrong. We've been preaching at them instead of living before them and being their standard. The same thing with the world, not just our kids. We've been preaching at the world, telling them what they have to change to serve God, Amen. what they have to do to be a Christian. No, we have to live before them and do it ourselves and give them an example to see and be. And when we do that, the world will then begin to change. Yeah. When they see how to honor, when they see how to live, when they see how to respect, we're not going to have any trouble getting them saved. We're not going to have any trouble getting them doing it. And my last part is God's part. You want to know God's part? Yes. He said, when you honor him, he's going to honor you. You don't have to worry about that part. The moment that you get the honor and you do all the things, go through the Bible. Find out what the husband's part is. Find out what the wife's part is. Every place, there's so many places. I could be here for three weeks teaching you on all the places it says that we are to do things of honor and places of honor and things that we're supposed to do. It's so much stuff. 
but people have just not paid any attention to it. But I'm telling you, you will not live a more fulfilled life than the moment that you start doing the things of honor for the Lord, because he's going to start pouring honor and blessing right back in your lap more than you know what to do with Amen. the moment that you start doing that. Amen. And you'll find, you'll see a difference in your spouse. You'll see a difference in your kids. You'll see a difference in your family. Amen. You'll see a difference in everybody around you because you don't have to change it then. Amen. Then it's his responsibility to change it. Can you say amen? amen? Stand up on your feet.